Hello everyone and welcome to our eight in the series of lectures here for YouTube for the eight push class. This one is on the presidency of John Adams. Uh, this will be a pretty quick one. <laughs> Not that I'm saying that John Adams presidency wasn't all that important, but it's a one-term presidency. And again, I'm only going to cover the main highlights. So we'll go ahead and get right into that. So John Adams, elected president in 1796, takes his oath of office in 97, and he served just the one year. He was a Boston lawyer, as many of us perhaps remember from the uh, American Revolution. And, you know, somebody who had carved out a pretty good name for himself. Uh, very uh, outspoken leader during the days of the Continental Congress. He's a guy that uh, worked hard to bring us the Declaration of Independence. He was married to Abigail Adams, a very important, influential woman herself in American history. I say he was a leader in the fight for independence during the con uh, con uh, sorry, Continental Congress. He was also the foreign minister to France and to England. So he had a lot of... Uh, a lot of experience in government, uh, worked hard in creating this new government that we, that we now enjoy today. When George Washington was elected president, of course he was uh, elected unanimously, uh, the fight, real fight was over who would be the vice president. And John Adams won out of that. So he is America's first vice president, a role that he desperately, desperately despised. Uh, at one time, I'm going to have you guys look at the Constitution, and you're going to see that really there, are, there is no real constitutional role for the vice president. His only real constitutional duty, he sits as president of the Senate. And all he does is break a tie vote. That's it. John Adams would famously say that God in all of his infinite wisdom could never have conceived of a more useless job than that of vice president. In fact, very few vice presidents will eventually become president. And we're going to talk a lot about that in history as well. This is actually not a stepping stone to the presidency, especially in the early going of the republic. Uh, being secretary of state turns out to be a much, much better position to be in in order to eventually become president, as John Adams will find out the hard way. Well, like I said, he does become president here, though, um, but he's only going to be a one-term president. He has a very difficult personality to deal with. Uh, by his own words, and you know, people refer to him as obnoxious and disliked. Uh, uh, he gives in to his temper often, uh, where he might yell more often than not, than where Washington really never would. Uh, so, you know, he has a hard time making and holding on to friends. Let's just say it that way. Now, there are flaws in the election of 1796. Yes, uh, the situation is, is that the Constitution reads that whoever wins the Electoral College is president. Whoever comes in second it's going to be vice president. Now, it was easy for Washington's two terms because everybody knew he was going to be president no matter what. So in 1788, 1792, Washington wins hands down. But now we get the election of 1796, an election now that comes down to mere personalities. On one hand, you have a Federalist by the name of John Adams. You have a Republican and Thomas Jefferson. These two men who are friends are going to run against each other. The Constitution did not allow for political parties at this time period. So again, the idea whoever wins is president, whoever comes in second, vice president. Well, guess what? Adams won the election of 96, but Jefferson came in second place. So now you have this situation where the president of the United States is one political party and the vice president is a completely different political party. Adams is a Federalist. Jefferson is a Republican. Not going to make for a good presidency for John Adams. 
He is going to constantly be in a situation where his vice president is going to be looking over his shoulders. Uh-oh. 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 Yeah, that's what it's going to be like for four years for poor John Adams. Thomas Jefferson is not really going to be a good supporter for him, and he's always going to be looking for that opportunity in the election of 1800 to basically get rid of John Adams. And that's exactly what's going to happen. We'll talk a little bit about that on Thursday, the election of 1800. Well, last time I talked with you, I told you how there was a lot of issues uh, with France, with George Washington's presidency. George Washington declares neutrality. Well, those issues do not go away. They're going to even intensify and get worse. Uh, Jay's Treaty, which we talked about in the last video, this is something that will very much anger the French. The French are upset because they feel like they have this Treaty of Union that was signed in 1778 during the American Revolution, an American should honor that treaty. Well, Washington didn't want to honor that treaty because they're in a revolution and they've overthrown that government. The king of France was beheaded. So as far as Washington was concerned, he didn't have to honor that treaty anymore. The French start to impress. And I mentioned this in the last video. This is where you're forcing merchant sailors and you're capturing them on the high seas and you're impressing them or forcing them to join your navy. The English did this first, and the English will do this for a long time against Americans. And this is always going to anger America. But now the French are doing it as well. So John Adams wants to see, hey, what's up, French people? Like, I thought we were friends here. I didn't realize you were going to start impressing us as well. So he sent a diplomatic commission to France. The head of that diplomatic commission is a man named John Marshall. We're going to talk a lot about John Marshall later on. And he went to go meet the French foreign minister, a guy by the name of Talleyrand. Again, he is the minister of France. He's French. John Marshall, American. John Marshall and his commission are going to France to meet Talleyrand. But when they get there, first of all, they're, they're given the runaround. Uh, they're never able actually to meet him. And eventually, these three French go-betweeners show up. These three guys, basically. They tell these Americans that if you want to meet with Talleyrand, you're going to have to give us $250,000. John Marshall doesn't have that money on him, and he's angry, and he decides he's going to leave France altogether. So that commission leaves France. They never get to meet Talleyrand. They never get to talk about impressment. They never try to iron out any peace agreements. They leave. They're angry. When John Adams finds out about this, when Marshall gets back to America, he, you know, and, uh, he contacts Adams, lets him know what's happening, and eventually the newspapers get involved. And they don't want to name these Frenchmen by name. So they name them Mr. X, Mr. Y, and Mr. Z. This becomes the XYZ affair. $250,000 bribe was asked from these three men. And John Adams made sure that this was in the newspapers. And a famous saying of the day, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. And so America now starts to prepare for war with France war that America really couldn't fight, not really. However, Adams does create the Naval Department. He becomes the first president to add a member to the cabinet, the Navy Department. In some respects, people call John Adams then the father of the American Navy. He also reestablishes a Marine Corps, which is part of the, of the Navy at the time. They begin to build ships. America didn't have a fleet. Now they're starting to build ships to fight the French. And from 1798 
1800 for two years, America goes into what's called an undeclared war, or sometimes some textbooks will call it a quasi-war. We don't declare war on France, but America's brand new navy will go down into the West Indies, the Caribbean, and they'll begin to fight French ships there. And you know what? America wins many of these battles down there. Now in the meantime, you see I have up here Alien and Sedition Acts. The Jeffersonian Republicans are pro-French. The Federalists are pro-British. This is why this becomes a huge mess. Jefferson, as vice president, doesn't want America to antagonize the French at all. He wants to make nice with the French. He wants to always join with the French. Whereas Alexander Hamilton, who is still the leader of the Federalist Party, and he's not a friend of John Adams by any stretch of the imagination, he wants to go to war with France because he's pro-British. Eventually, the Federalists that control both houses of Congress by this time period decide to pass a series of laws, collectively known as Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien Acts, there are actually three of them. There was the Naturalization Act that extended time immigrants had to live in the United States to become citizens from five years to 14 years. Now, why would they make it so an immigrant coming to America had to wait longer to become an American? Well, most immigrants coming to America and they would see the two different parties would recognize the Jeffersonian Republicans as a party that they were more interested in than the Federalist. So many immigrants were joining the Republicans. So this was trying to stop them. The second part of the Alien Act was the Alien Enemies Act. That provided that once war had been declared, all male citizens of an enemy nation could be arrested, detained, and deported. Now, of course, this will never happen because America never declares war against France. Uh, the third part is the Alien Friends Act. This allowed the president to deport any non-citizen who suspected against plotting against the government during either wartime or peacetime. Again, this will never happen. But this was the three parts of the Alien Act. The Naturalization Act, the Alien Enemies Act, and the Alien Friends Act. Then you had the Sedition Act. Uh, sedition. All right. A sedition means basically inciting other, in, any individual to resist or rebel against the lawful authority. So in this case, the government in the United States is the lawful authority, and especially the Federalists. So anyone who incites or, or tries uh, incites rebellion or tries to resist the government is committing acts of sedition. Uh, the U.S. Sedition Act outlawed conspiracies to oppose any measure or measures of the government. So if you oppose anything against the government during this time period, you're committing sedition. Now it's interesting that this act said that any false, scandalous, or malicious writing against members of Congress or the President of the United States was in fact sedition. Did you notice who they didn't say? The act said that if you wrote anything false, scandalous, or malicious against the Congress or against the President of the United States, you've committed sedition. There's no mention of the vice president, and that was on purpose. Thomas Jefferson's Republicans. These two acts were meant to hurt Jeffersonian Republicans. That's the whole purpose of these laws. John Adams will sign these laws into force, something that he will regret basically for the rest of his life, because the Alien Act and the Sedition Act basically hurt freedom of, of speech and freedom of press. If you spoke in any way against the government, you're going to go to jail. Now, while the Alien Acts were never enforced, the Sedition Act will be. Mostly newspaper men will be arrested and put in jail. Those men who support Thomas Jefferson. Yes, that Thomas Jefferson. The famous Thomas Jefferson. Uh, okay, well, never mind. I was going to... There we go. Federalists want full-fledged war with the French.
John Adams does not. He doesn't want war. The whole time they're fighting this quasi-war, 98 to 1800, Adams has sent other peace negotiators to France, and he is secretively negotiating peace with the French. This is going to cause a break in the Federalist Party. You have the normal Federalists, like John Adams, versus what's called the High Federalists. Alexander Hamilton will now demand that John Adams is kicked out of his party. And the Federalists are doing very stupid things. Not only have they passed this uh, Sedition Acts and Alien Acts, but they also tried to pass a Stamp Act in order to raise money to create an army to invade France. That's just crazy. Right? The, here, a Stamp Act. And yet, that's what the Federalists did. So everything that Jefferson had ever argued against, the Federalists being kingly, during this time period, the Federalists began to act extremely kingly. And John Adams is the face of that. Well, Jefferson isn't done. He's not going to give up without a fight. So he and his good friend... Guess who? That would be James Madison will write what's called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. So he begins to fight the Federalists and the Alien Act and the Sedition Acts. They secretively, this is done in secret, pen a series of what's known as resolutions that they propose before Congress. In 98 and 99, Jefferson wrote the Kentucky Resolutions. And in 98, James Madison wrote the Virginia Resolutions. Basically, these are things that you bring, a resolution, something you bring before Congress, trying to create a law. Now, they never become law. The Kentucky and Virginia resolutions will never become law, but they're put out there. And one of the main gist, one of the main thoughts behind these things is what Thomas Jefferson will refer to as compact theory. Now, you might remember that word compact, going back to the Mayflower Compact. That means an agreement, right? What Jefferson proposes in these resolutions is that the federal government was the creation of the 13 states, that the 13 states got it together in agreement and created the federal government. Thereby, since the states created the government, the states have a right to nullify, nullification, any law they don't like of the federal government. This creates nullification theory. Now, like I said, this will never become law, but compact theory and nullification theory will stay in the South for decades. We're going to talk about this multiple times. This is a seed that Jefferson plants that will sprout the Civil War. The South will always now think of the government as a compact that the states create the government, while the North will never see it that way, that the, the North will always view the government as, this, as the government. It was a creation of the people, not the states. And so this will become a major argument for decades now to come. This will also bring an end to John Adams' presidency. On Thursday, we're going to talk about the election of 1800 in class. Having gone to war with France, his popularity went up, but passing the Alien and Sedition Acts, John Adams' popularity crashes and burns. And another election comes. But remember I told you, Jefferson would never be president if it wasn't for another compromise. What compromise am I talking about? Some of you, I bet some of you right now are just saying it out loud. You're right there at your computer and you're going, Mr. Linhart, this is what it is. This is what it is. While others of you are looking at your computer and going, Do I, am I really listening to this? Is this really going to go 20 minutes? Seriously, he's not going to give me the answer. 1959. Oh, there we are. 20 minutes. Three-fifths compromise. The three-fifths compromise allowed Jefferson to become president because they have extra electoral votes. Without that, we never would have gotten to this moment between Jefferson and Adams. So in class on Thursday, we're going to go over the election of 1800. So that brings an end to this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. This was a quicker one, and I'll see you soon.